I have um, organized my presentation into three parts. And first part, like any other engineer, I would like to try to make a case based on the data that you would see. And you heard all of this today morning, so I'm not going to speak. I'm not going to present anything new, but I'm going to substantiate with the data on what you're seeing there. The second part, we're going to look at some predictions from the past so that we can learn from how those predictions played and then get ready for the future. The third one, which is the most important aspect, is about what is that we can do or what are the skills that we can um, cultivate at this point in time so that we'll be ready for the future. So kind of divided my presentation to three part and obviously we are running late so I try to squeeze five minutes out of my time and then you know get back on the schedule. I'll start with a quote from Albert Einstein which talks about automation. When this was about 100 or 100 plus years back and talks about the ultimate automation and the vision of ultimate automation can only be possible with intelligence that's beyond human intelligence. And we, let's, let's refer that as a super intelligence for a moment for, for this discussion's sake. How is this super intelligence will evolve is four different trends coming together. The first one is the computing power. Number two, devices. Number three, connectivity. And number four, artificial intelligence. So some of the things that you talk about IoT and all that is kind of kind of abstracted them into these four. And then let's examine these four aspects and see how they're changing everything for us. Computing power, and all of you are aware of the Moore's law, what started as a 10,000 transistors in a given space are a chip to 15 billion in 2016. And even if you hit the physical limits, there are new technologies that are evolving and then that will continue the evolution of exponentially growing computing power, right? What does this computing power mean? This is the data that you could see it there. The right? human brain is about 30,000 trillion transactions or rather instructions per second. That's a computing power, right? And if you evolve the current technology in the next five to 10 years, you would hold a device that's equivalent of human brain. That's number one. But if you continue the evolution, and you will also see in probably another 30, 40 years, a device in your hand capable of all of the human brains on the earth. It's difficult to imagine the possibilities, what you can do with that kind of a computing power, right? And the another interesting factor is all of that for a few thousand dollars, right? That's what is changing around. Devices, all of you hold a smartphone and some of you wear the wearable devices, let's say iPhone, you know, the iWatch, Apple watches and so on and so forth. And Alexa's augmented reality devices, the devices are evolving very fast. And they're shrinking or the size is going down day by day, but also the prices are coming down. And that evolution will continue to happen. And what about the connectivity costs or the availability of connectivity? In 2016, mid, when you, all of you have seen the, when Geo is launched, what happened to the connectivity costs, right? So, and also today morning when you had the remote places where the fiber is laid, the connectivity will be one, it's available, and two, it will be affordable. And third one is artificial intelligence. So, uh, Probably the artificial intelligence existed more than 100 years, some of the algorithms. And it's gaining momentum last four or five years, primarily because computing power is cheaper, connectivity is there, and the devices will be able to use this intelligence. And whether you notice or not, all of you are served by artificial intelligence today. If you are using Google Maps, it is powered by artificial intelligence. If you are using search engines, it is powered by artificial intelligence. If you are using Alexa at home, it is powered by artificial intelligence. So artificial intelligence is already within your pocket or at your home already. 
So the point I'm trying to make is the super intelligence is close and it's here and it is fueled by these four forces, one fueling another. What does it mean to all of us? So today morning we heard at what phase these changes are happening, right? And one of the statistics that you heard from KK2, it took 75 years for a phone to get to 50 million users. Angry Birds took 35 days. Google says any application that they launch, it has to serve billion users minimum, right? And that too within few months of it. That is the scale at, and speed at which these things are happening. And it is easy for us to see where the investments are going, how the valuation is happening. And then right side, you see a table where in 2001, only one technology company is there in the top five most valued companies, right? Fast forward 15 years, you have only the technology companies. What it means is technology is everything. Technology is, will be there in every industry that you foresee. In financial services, automobile, you name it, including the education, right? So today morning, when I don't know whether some of you noticed the Hindu, Finland actually deployed robot to teach English to the children in the elementary school, right? So every industry could be education, anything that you take it in agriculture, everything will be disrupted by the technology. Let's look at some of the predictions. 1883, New York Medical General said public education will exhaust the children's brain. I don't know what would they say if they visit Namakal now. 1926, when telephones came in, they said telephone will break up home life and you know the practice of visiting friends. More people travel than ever now. In 1936, when radio came in, gramophone magazine said children will be distracted by the radio and won't, they won't do their homework. You know, children have more distractions than ever. 1959, mathematician I.J. Good said all problems in science and technology will be handed over to machines and we'll no longer to have to work. People are working more than ever. 1995, internet will collapse in 1990, which is said by Robert, who was actually inventor of network, Ethernet, right? And you know, if internet collapses today, that would be more than any other, any natural disaster we have ever seen. The point I'm trying to make is, there'll be predictions. Anything from nothing is going to happen and all the way to the world is going to collapse, right? So our job is, when we are confronted with this uncertainty, prepare with something that's foundation, a strong foundation that would sail us through these uncertain times. So when you look at it, this boils down to what is required for us to look into the fourth industrial revolution, what skills are required. At Sintel, about four years back, we were confronted with the same challenges. What we noticed is the one fundamental shift, morning you heard that learn, perform cycles have been shrunk very rapidly. Let's say, my father's generation, they go to college, learn something, and walk through their 30, 40 years with a little bit of incremental learning. That served very well for that generation. Let's say our generation, when we joined, let's say as a programmer, I learned DB2 and IBM from IBM. And every three years or so, there will be a new release, a new version. I need to learn once in three years, four years. And we have friends from in the industry here, Salesforce, let's say, ask them how frequently they're adding new features to the software on force.com platform. 
if not daily will be minimum weekly okay so what it means for us even for the industry it's no longer learning and performing for few years it is about learning every day and performing every day so that is the cycle that we are operating if that's the fundamental shift then we said how are we going to help our employees to learn how are we going to manage all of this then we said there is no way you can manage it and we said we will not tell our employees what to learn anymore and we launched a program called Sintel X.0 and foundation for that is employee will learn based on their own interest based on their own aptitude and based on what is required for the projects on a regular basis but Sintel will pro provide the platform for them to learn and managers will act like coaches for them to guide when the help is needed okay so that's basically democratizing learning and that is based on a foundation what we say the commit to learn every day rest of your life that's a foundational change that we brought into our organization what it means to the organizations let's say the education institutes teach them how to learn and if they know how to learn they can sail through the rest of it okay. then there are a few other things that we have been always been talking about it all of you are familiar with you know complex problem solving working with the diverse teams and service orientation but if you look at the other side these things are not common for engineering students right for example cognitive flexibility dealing with two outcomes at the same time or two opposing ideas and staying with them that's not common because we are engineers are trained with numbers certainty whereas artificial intelligence machines work with the probabilities and possibilities art students do very well with this that means students should be able to deal with ambiguity and uncertainty more than ever can we train them to deal with that as they go through the courses right and the other one is interdisciplinary approach if you are wearing a, let's say apple watch today on your hand what is it it's a mobile device it's heartbeat monitor for your health as a health monitor it's a fitness tracker and probably 20 other things that you don't know what it means is as future work comes in appreciation for multiple multidisciplinary um, knowledge is very very important and working with that very quickly learning and working with that is very, very important. And yesterday, some of you went through design thinking, right? And when you take those principles and say what is important is a visualization. And we don't cultivate that for the engineers enough. Right? These are the three things that we said we are unable to get students with that and we were, we were to cultivate these things in our employees. So those are the three changes that we did. Interest of time, I'll kind of summarize it and see what are the takeaways for today. Technology will shape everything that you have today. Changes will be faster than ever. Technology progress has competing effects, which means it will destroy some jobs, but it will create other jobs. And if you allow or facilitate transition, people will succeed. Education needs, system needs to evolve faster. We don't have much time for, you know, making structural changes, but it has to evolve very fast. And industry will be forced to look for quality, no longer the larger number. Thank you.